Hi everyone, good afternoon, thank you for being here, all of you who are present here, and thank you all for being online as well. So thank you Miraldo, it's always nice to, always important to thank you. So we're about to start the second debate uh, about literacies and phonics, and today our guest speaker is Professor Dr. Bill Cope. Thank you very much Professor for being here. Thank you Lynn, Valkyria and Anna. Um, so, some uh, initial messages, yes, okay, this, yeah, okay, so it's always uh, important to remind that this event, this second debate, also is connected and belongs to the Projeto Nacional de Letramentos, Linguagem, Cultura, Educação e Tecnologia, which is a national project of teacher education, and we can go on, Bill, thank you. And this is what we've done so far. So the first debate was Debate 1, Letramentos e Método Fônico. Just a second. Okay. Letramentos e Método Fônico. Foi no dia 22 de abril. Today, the second debate, Literacies and Phonics with Professor Bill Cope. And we're thinking about the third one to close the year and the, the, the debates. Literacies and Phonics Part 3 with Professor Dr. Brian Morgan in November and the date is to be confirmed, okay? So then let me explain how this uh, debate is going to work, how it's going to be presented. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're going to start, uh, the four of us, so I am Daniel Ferraz, Ana Paula Duboc, Valkyria Montemor, Limario Menezes de Souza. So we have five minutes to kind of wrap up our presentation from the first debate. So it's only five to seven minutes just to, um, especially for those who are not here in the, uh, in the first debate. And then Professor Bill Cope is going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we're going to open for questions, okay? And, and uh, Mary, and Mary. And if we can make the technology work, uh, Mary is online, so if I'm looking down, it's because I'm frantically texting. Oh, great. So we also have Mary online uh, participating. Thank you, Bill. I'd like to say that Hoshani uh, Hoju is not here, and it is because of personal issues, unfortunately, and that we do hope she will be here in the third debate. And then, uh, to finish, some initial uh, messages first. Well, first of all, sign the list with your full name and email. We're going to send the certificates to you later. And those who are watching through YouTube, please send an email to Projeto Nacional São Paulo, SP, at gmail.com with your full name, your identity, and your institution, okay? And for questions, if you have questions, write down, jot down your questions and leave for, for the debate time. And those who are online, you can either um, ask a question through YouTube. Yes, Miraldo, you can ask a question through the chat of YouTube. Or you can send your questions to Projeto Nacional SP and Gabriela is checking the, the email as well. Okay? So once again, thank you very much for being here. And let's start. Uh, we'll start with Ana Paula. I'm just going to, uh, this, by the way, there's Mary on line. And I'm just going to start to... Oh, she, she, she might 
say hello. But three. one of the things I realised that the audio is not working for her, so just give me one moment, and I will um, see if I can make that work. So unmute. There we go. Can you hear us now? Do you want to wave if you can hear us? Oh, she can hear. Okay, there she is. So she'll come on a little bit later. So, okay, back to you. Okay, sorry, and Mary as well. So I think Anna Paula and I are going to start. So our first, um, our first presentation in the first debate, we decided to do it in two parts. The first part, we um, we briefly differentiated the literacies. So we, we talked about our perspective on the differences between lit the literacy movement, but also starting from the critical pedagogy from F F F Paulo Freire. And then we talked a little bit about the critical literacies, new literacies, multi-literacies, and the last movement course that we've been calling lit Literacies Made in Brazil. So basically that was my job in the first presentation. And I'm not going, going to get into all that today, but I'd like to emphasize that even though there, there are differences in every literacy movement, they are all, they're all um, at least on our, in our perspective, they are all trying to revisit what we understand as language education or what we used to call English language teaching or foreign language teaching in Brazil. I think they, they have this, 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 um, this common aspect amongst others. Okay, so I'll pass on to Anna. Well, good afternoon, boa tarde a todos. Uh, as Daniel was saying, um, last May, uh, Roshani, Valkyria, Lynn, Daniel, and myself gathered uh, to have the first debate on, on this big divide regarding phonics and literacies. Uh, and that debate was also broadcasted on live on YouTube, having reached uh, more than 2,000 views. That means that this as a big issue to be discussed on and on and on. By the time Daniel and I uh, shared an analysis of the approved national literacy uh, policy decree, o decreto que havia sido lançado pelo governo Bolsonaro, under Bolsonaro's government, whose main point, as we all know here, is the establishment of a phonic-based literacy policy founded on a cognitive perspective. Our analysis, uh, which is about to be published uh, in a journal, an international journal, highlights four discursive aspects present in the decree, and I'm gonna uh, retrieve those four aspects. That is, one, a deliberately chosen a word in Portuguese of literacia instead of letramento. There is no mentioning of the ter term letramento. That means a lot to us. Two, the so-called literacy essential elements, be one of them, the phonemic awareness. Three, the evidence-based discourse. And four, the fostering of a teacher education program, which are strongly cognitive-based. As discourse analysis never happens in a vacuum, the language plus other stuff in G's term was made present, of course, as from a macro perspective, Daniel and I analyzed that and could pinpoint that all the values, theories, beliefs, and interests driving Bolsonaro's literacy policy places itself as a very new conservative policy marked by a new liberal, uh, political, militarized, and ideological move. A move that now, more recently, gains momentum with the publication of the National Literacy Policy Manual. É o novo manual da política Nacional de Alfabetização, which was released 15 days ago. Uh, so we should read that carefully. Um, among the several, and Daniel and I read this manual, which was published uh, some, some days ago, and, and our literacy policy uh, gets even worse, in the sense that among the several pernicious argumentative strategies that seek to persuade the reader uh, with regards to this evidence-based argument, uh, we would like to pinpoint five now regarding the manual. One, a strong 
presence of, a, of what we call the statement of authority, um, with the constant mentioning of well-succeeded global north countries uh, in, in the ways that they have coped with the literacy wars in their local context. Então, há uma menção a Finlândia, Estados Unidos, Inglaterra, como países que souberam, com, baseado uh, em, em uma, uma orientação cognitiva, baseada em evidências, souberam superar o problema do analfabetismo. Uh, the second point is the, the same strategy, the statement of authority, with regards to well-known scholars, including academics, exclusively doing research from the field of a very traditional cognitive science. And some of them are also foreign. So again, uh, there is this statement of authority bringing the quotes by scholars, which makes the manual very uh, objective and pure science. Uh, the third one is a discursive appropriation of a somehow medical jargon, as it constantly refers to the brain and the mind from a very traditional cognitive and neuroscience perspective. Nowadays, we do have new trends even in neurosciences. Uh, but there is this medical jargon that seeks to persuade the reader, uh, turning the document into a very objective and clear-cut uh, text. And the fourth one, the last one, is a brief yet peculiar religious discourse appealing to families as the brief mentioning of the Matthew effect is made with the mentioning of a parable, a parable, the parable of the talents, uh, according to the Gospel of Matthew. So there is this, although be, uh, despite being brief, it's something that calls attention. Uh, and the, the last one is, is a linear, fixed, and clear-cut set of literacy strategies that pretty much echo Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, there is even a pyramid out there establishing the levels of literacy in accordance to the child's target uh, age. Well, as the evidence-based literacy policy uh, is sustained by the manual with the same evidence-based orientation, <coughs> full of authorized discourses, uh, we wonder how can we now, literacy researchers and, and teachers, who have conceived of literacy as a social practice can truly find ways to establish a dialogue um, with those who have been uh, easily persuaded by, by this very well-orchestrated discourse full of medical jargons and evidence uh, as, as we see by the time we, we read the manual. I believe this is one of the main concerns among many of us who have discussed literacy issues from a more critical sociological lens. Um, and this debate seeks to open uh, this terrain for an urgent call for social mobilization and the addressing of alternatives. It's high time that we discuss openly what is at stake under this new literacy policy. My turn now. Uh, Okay, so uh, just to wrap up something that we discussed last time in our debate one, uh, I just to re remind to remind some of you uh, that attended our debate one and just to tell the other ones that were not present and I mean could not be present. Uh, I'd like to say that I gave I gave emphasis to two topics. Okay, in debate one, the first one explaining. Uh, the difference, I mean, the, the why phonics became so uh, relevant in Brazil, right? Uh, but this is something that I think Ana Paula has uh, explained very well. Uh, I mean, so I'm not going to structure to give, you know, just details, but just to emphasize that uh, historically thinking, uh, phonics was very important to Brazil, especially because uh, um, we've always been in a political situation that uh, was not interested in critique. This is my point. So this is the reason why phonics uh, was very much convenient, I think, for education in Brazil. Although phonics is, can, can be more broadening okay, than uh, the way that it was used here, uh, it was very uh, limited, okay, to 
how do I say that, to a, a kind of um, non a neutral education. So if you remember, this is the, the, the heyday of phonics that we discussed was still, I mean, I think all, all decades before the 90s, I would say. But anyway, um, what is important is they were interested in neutrality, okay, this kind of uh, idea. So many people say that uh, it was due to dictatorship in the 60s, from the 60s on. However, we before had, um, uh, you know, restrictions in education as well in the other governments, right? Okay, this is something that we can discuss a little more if you are interested later, right? Let's check this last. Uh, yeah, this is this is uh, just a, this is what I, this is a let's say a summary of what I said. I gave some some ideas about phonics. Okay, it's okay. still there, I think. Uh, and after that, I, I decided to tell you our view of uh, literacy here in Brazil. Just making you know that this is also my understanding. Something that I've I've written about about the three generations of literacy in Brazil. The first one, um, I would say, it started with uh, Freire to us, right? So it was a moment when uh, uh, people uh, started questioning the idea of alphabetization that we used to have based on phonics, right? And then Freire uh, decided that uh, uh, not, not only to test and to think of other methodologies to teach, but also started writing and many people started discussing this, especially in the academia, but also in, in the schools. And this um, was very much debated in Brazil by the time. But then we had dictatorship, if you remember, right? Or if you, you've, uh, you all know about it. So after this moment, I think that we, what we had? We had uh, just a, a neutral education, right, for, for a certain time. So after that, I think by the, the 80s, we started having access to some other, um, I would say, uh, researchers, such as Jack Goody, such as Olson, such as uh, Brian Street, okay? And this is for me, when uh, we, we started visualizing a second generation emerging in Brazil. Uh, but then it would just, um, I would say, it would just refer to, not refer, but it was much adopted by Portuguese, rather than the other disciplines in the schools. So for me, this is the analogy that I make uh, between uh, Portuguese and mother tongue. For me, it's like the mother-like uh, attitude. Or so it's like Portuguese being responsible for education. So uh, that would they would concentrate all education, students' education. I mean, in in the literacy that was practiced by by Portuguese language, and reading became very important as well. So we would have in foreign languages, for example, we started having what was called English instrumental and so on. So there is a third generation for, for me that uh, is the one that comes from uh, the movement in literacies in various countries, including Brazil. This is the one that uh, um, we've we've had partnership with uh, Bill Copernicus and some other uh, some other researchers from the London the New London Group, and uh, this is then uh, let's say uh, this was brought to Brazil. However, uh, not exactly the same way that was uh, practiced in other countries. I mean, our idea was to have it situated local, rethought locally. Right, so that's why now we say that we have a third generation of literacies in Brazil, and this one is uh, is seen as an educational proposal that is going to think of this transdisciplinarity, space and place, understanding that we cannot have the same kind of space that we used to have in our formal, I mean, formal model of schools. I mean, this the, the Enlightenment model of schools, uh, identity and subjectivity thinking of plurality and diversity, and having these other issues that uh, had been a bit neglected or not emphasized in what we call the written language society. And I've been writing also about the two kinds of society that we've had based on uh, theories developed by Bill and Mary. 
So investigating globalization, technology, and the two kinds of society as well. A society that, uh, the Britain, Britain language society as the one that was interested in, in, in simplifying language, I would say, in order to make it didactic to teach or to disseminate how to read and write. And uh, digital society as the one that rescues uh, the other, I would say, the other relevances, I would say, in language, right? that had been neglected by the written language society. Neglected is not the kind of book that I would like to say, but it doesn't, any other book does not come to my mind now. Okay, so this is what, uh, basically, what I concentrated on uh, last time. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bom, a gente ficou uh, discutindo um pouco em que, em que língua nós íamos fazer isso, então, uh, já que, já que uh, o que nós, nós que já falamos na, na primeira vez, uh, falamos em português, nós não estamos acrescentando grandes coisas nessas nossas falas, estamos retomando o que já foi falado, então, o que já foi falado já está disponível online. Mas o objetivo, como disse a Ana Paula, é, o objetivo dessa série de debates é mobilização. E o que nós vimos nesses últimos dias, como às vezes a mobilização precisa de outros interlocutores, nem sempre aqui de dentro do país. Então, talvez com, essa, com esse objetivo, a, a falar em inglês significa que podemos ser... A, entendidos para além das fronteiras. Uhum. Bom, o, resumindo o que eu falei antes, eu começo aqui com, a, a, com o título em português para que não haja dúvida nenhuma, né? exatamente sem autoritarismo. So the phonics proposal that uh, we have discussed claims authority because of its supposedly scientific nature, as Ana Paula mentioned. Uh, the so-called evidence-based scientific nature of the phonics proposal, which contrasts a little bit, their use of science contrasts a little bit with their use of religion as well, but okay, that's a contradiction that opens uh, space for debate. It bases itself on a concept of science as universal, objective, and neutral. This concept of science as universal, in fact, hides the locus of enunciation of science, its ideological and historical position. The fact that the knowledge that is uh, sold to us as science is produced by people located in a specific place with specific interests um, at a specific uh, period of time. So by hiding the subject that produces scientific knowledge, the concept of universal science hides not only its ideological interests, but also gives the illusion of being neutral and objective. The phonics proposal, based on a concept of universal validity, does not take into account what the learner knows, nor the fact that learners know different things, and that these different things are not individual, but socially, historically, and ideologically constituted. The proposal is based then on the concept of the learner as an empty vessel. In contrast, Freire's proposal of literacy, in, and we have to understand that phonics comes in the, in the wake of a rejection of Freire. So Freire's proposal of literacy as social practice sees knowledge as varied and socially and ideologically constituted. It sees learners as knowing social beings who bring to the learning process the knowledge they acquire in their social context. It sees literacy as an introduction of the learner into a new world of knowing in writing, a world where the knowledge in circulation is different to that which the non-literate learner possesses. So from Freire's perspective, the, the idea of learning to read is going into a world which is different to the world the non-literate learner already has. So the non-literate learner is not someone who doesn't have knowledge. 
One of Freire's objectives was to undo the self-image of non-literate learners as incapable of learning and as possessors of non-knowledge. He did this by making non-literate learners aware that they, in fact, are possessors of knowledge and capable of constructing knowledge, and making them aware that the negative self-image that they have of themselves was constructed to keep them in their socially marginal positions. The phonics proposal, then, may be seen as a political ideological instrument of keeping people where they are, depriving them of critical awareness and depriving them of the possibility of acquiring new knowledge and transforming their social worlds. As such, the phonics proposal deprives learners of the possibility of being critical citizens, where critical means identifying what is wrong in their community and offering them the possibility of transforming this themselves. Uh, I'd just like to end by saying we're not criticizing phonics proposals in general, as Arcadia and Anna Paula mentioned. There are many different kinds of phonics proposals. We are criticizing the phonics proposal that our government is proposing, which is very specifically uh, science-based, hides behind this aura of universality, of scientificity, and neutrality. Thank you, Anna Paula, for Kiria Lin. So now, Mary Kalantis is going to say a few words as well. Thank you so much, Mary. Let's just check if everything's okay with technology. Oh, yeah. Hi, Mary. Uh, we can't hear you. We can't, yeah. Just a moment. Yeah. Okay. Wait there, wait there. Let me just see if I can get it. It's not coming through the... Oh, okay. um, oh I'll put on. Yeah, yeah. No, we, I can hear you. That's good. Where's the sound of this? Can you hear me? Oh, so, um, say something. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, we'll just get... No, we can hear you, but not, not strongly. Not the audience, yeah. I think uh, maybe it's to the loudspeaker. Oh, can, can you, you do, do that? that? Sorry. I this, is, this is what I was trying to do earlier. But Sorry. Uh, I don't know if I have the adapter, because your, your notebook is on that. It's a Mac, yeah. Do you, you have the adapter? I've got every adapter you want to name. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> In the back, yeah. So just take it out. Um, sorry, no, no, here. Elena. Sorry, we'll try and get you on just a moment. You've got the camera pointing down now. Point the camera back up. What is this one? Here it is. Yes. Just a second, let me see. Yeah. Okay. So check the 
the first one about phonics itself and critique. Okay, and I'm just going to say, I know what Bill's going to say, and this this is a kind of programming of what Bill says too. But I've, I've read the uh, Anna and Daniel's paper very closely, and I've heard what you had to say, and you do critique really well. In fact, that's what we do best of all as academics, critique. But I have to say to you, in terms of phonics, there is simply no point in engaging in a war about it. Greg, did you hear that? Yes, yes. Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Well, yeah. that, that right. The war, the war, as you quite rightly point out, that it's behind from us from where in academics. And we know every single part of it. And engaging in it again is a lost opportunity. I don't think critiquing it as terrific as it is matters. What you, you should be doing is taking those ideas, as Anna and Daniel's paper says, to ordinary people, but, you know, to the local women's magazines, to the radio stations, to, you know, the counter-science in ordinary language, uh, to go out with the message of the science and understanding you have rather than just a critique of phonics, because um, the other point I want to make, which comes from Daniel's uh, and Anne's paper, uh, is uh, the crack in the wall. Remember Leonard Cohen? There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. You know, you have to have that orientation. Where are the cracks where you can make a difference in practice and enable teachers to make a difference? It's about feature perfectionism, it's about repertoires of strategies, which include phonics, tracking performance, adjusting, collaborating. So I think that positive orientation to informing a public, right, and the educators is much better than amongst ourselves, quite rightly, critiquing what we all know so well. Uh, that's the first point I want to make. And the second point, which will go to Bill's second point, is Something that Prier said, which I think still matters today, and matters for what Bill's going to say in terms of trans trans transpositional grammars. And I'll just quote from Anna's paper. Reading the world always precedes reading the word. And reading the word implies continually reading the world. This movement from the world to the word and from the word to the world is always present even the spoken word flows from our reading of the world. No one could have said that better today about uh, the modern world. Uh, no one could have said that better about multiculturalism, about multiliteracies, about new literacies, about transpositional grammar. It encapsulated in what Freire said is exactly the message of today. And we have to be enable teachers to understand uh, that message. Uh, so I think a more a positive orientation towards a pragmatics of shifting backwards and forwards between those terrible things that are in the new policy and what we know is possible and enabling teachers to move in and out. And my very last point, which we can't address today, is unless we can change the examination system, we're up against a brick wall. All we're going to do is help teachers navigate what happens in the classroom better but then they have to deliver to these external uh, authorities. And that's a much different conversation and a much difficult uh, exercise. But it's great that you guys continue uh, to argue and to connect to your own history, like linking uh, the contributions of the world to your own history. And, and what I've read in the paper and what I've heard is always um, very illuminating and, and informative, informative for those of us who are interested in theory and history and critique. So that's all I wanted to say in response to this, and I'll uh, say a little bit more later. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Very interesting points, the three of them. So I'll pass on to Bill. Is that okay? Do you want guys to sit down there, because to see the slide, or do you prefer to stay here? No, stay, here. stay here? Okay, all right. So, Bill. Can you, can you see the slides? Because I have a, yeah, yeah. I have a whole lot of pictures. Yeah. Here. Yeah, we can see them. Yeah. Okay. So, Bill, once again, thank you very much. And then. Yours is so. Um, 
Said about phonics. Phonics, look, phonics has hit you all of a sudden, but this debate's been present in the English speaking world for decades, and it's as intense as ever. Uh, the Conservative government in Australia is just reintroducing phonics. The Conservative government in England's been doing it for a while. And um, um, she thought of this idea of calling it phony phonics, because what they try to do is they try to give these fun names. So jolly phonics, which is we're going to be happy doing phonics. Fun phonics, and uh, the irony must be lost on the people who did it, that they've spelt it, spelt it wrongly. So what they try and do for children is promise them that phonics is going to be fun, but it's actually really boring, and it's really bad pedagogy, and the kids kind of, the kids hate it. I'm going to show you why they hate it in a moment. So we're calling it phony phonics, because we want to be in the same uh, uh, jolly frame of mind. So where I think I should start, um, and where we should always start is we're going to start with a test. I'm going to give you a phonics test. Now this is a poor kid who only got 2 out of 20 in an Australian school for this phonics test. We've covered the kid's name up. Okay. So um, unfortunately, people on YouTube, you're going to have to wait till the slides come because you can't read it. And the first word in the test is, I'm, I've got to, I want you to spell the word, I've got to make it big, bigger for myself so I can even read it. Moment. Um, oh, sorry, 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 I better get to that. I can't do it. Um, the first word that we're going to give you is pib. Right? Spell pib. And the second word we're going to give you is vub. And the second word we're, the third word we're going to give you is yup. And then we're going to give you the word desh. Right? And this poor kid here only got two wrong, two right in the whole test. And a little bit further down, there's the word that, that we start introducing real <coughs> words. So it's this complete jumble of words which are not real, and it's simply about sound recognition and words which make no sense. And what the teachers done in the third column is they've written down what the kid said. And what the kid said was really sensible in terms of phonics. You know, the kid heard a sound the teacher was saying and then wrote it down. So this is this highly abstracted nonsense view of what knowledge is and what learning is. The, the words might mean something later in the list they're real words at the beginning of the list they're not real words and it doesn't matter they're not real because we want to get you into some kind of discipline around sounds now what i'm going to do is show you now the curriculum that goes with this right and this is the curriculum that goes with it. and these are some pages from the book you can see we've taken well, nicola yellen our colleague has taken photos from the book and let me say um nicola who gave me this stuff gave me the inspiration for calling it phony phonics. She's a professor of early childhood education at the University of Melbourne. Um, and there's a, there's a Kai. Did you pronounce that correctly? Or was it a Kigger? Um, here's a Gerst. Here's a Bame. Here's a Yoon. Here's a Desh. Here's a Poil. Here's a Yop. Here's an Elt. Now look, they put these little creatures there. But if I were to take this page away now and ask you which one was a Pib, don't forget Pib was in the test. Are you going to remember which of those characters is a pib as opposed to a poil? Right? So, um, now, what I'm going to say is, to give phonics its due, what it does is, eventually, when you get older and more grown up, they actually put the words into sentences. So, this is now a phonics reader which has been produced, and rather biz bizarrely, it's a fold-out. So, it's called Tick Tock, Tick Tock. So, we can imagine a nice story about clocks. You're about to imagine the story? Well, there are six frames in this, this little booklet, which you fold out. It says, Kim is sad, Dad is mad, tick tock, tick tock. What has tick tock got to do with being sad or mad? <laughs> tick tock, tick tock, Kim is mad, kick the sack, kick the sack, tick tock, um, tick tock, tick tock, the sock, the sack, tick tock, tick tock. That's the story. Now, you know, there are so many incredibly beautiful children's stories in the world which mean things. What are we doing here? This is cruel. The next one, by the way, is, about, is called Dad is Sad. 
So we can imagine dad being sad and we might feel emotionally connected to dad being sad. So dad is sad, are you ready for that? Okay, dad is a sad man. Oh, poor dad. <laughs> the din, the din, well okay, it's still vaguely coherent because there might have been a noise that was making you sad. There was a pin in a tin, well how that would make me sad, I don't know. And then Sid and the pan, now who's Sid? Is Sid dad? And is Sid, and by the way, Sid are numbered, so I'm keeping the story in sequence, I'm not mucking this up. Um, Sid and the pan, and then we have Tim and Pam. So where did Pam come in relation to Pan? Now I don't quite know, but it's obviously a contrast. Who said, I did, I did, I did, I did, I did, but I did what? Um, <laughs> did Dad nap? Now we're back to Dad somehow or other. How do we get back to Dad <laughs> in this story? Um, and then the poor kid writes on the back that the book belongs to them. Is this a book? No. <laughs> so then I, what I want to tell you is I want to tell you about scientific evidence. And then comes the scientific evidence. Because the scientific evidence is um, that if you do a trial, the kids can actually spell pip and pam and nam and tam and whatever these words are. And of course it works. What we can say is phonics works. Is what we do is we measure its success scientifically by what it sets itself to be. So don't forget every test is a relationship to curriculum. There's this old notion of validity in tests, which is the validity is you make sure you test what you've taught, you test what you've taught, and guess what, it works. So the, the US version of this uh, was the, um, in the George Bush administration, um, George Bush II, um, there was um, the No Child Left Behind Act, and the only kind of educational research that is now federally funded in the US is called Randomized Control Experimentation, where you keep the focus completely apolitical, nothing about meanings in the world, you test that things work, and guess what, phonics works. And all the evidence shows you that it works, and that there's a website created by the US Department of Education called What Works, and it tells you that phonics works. And I've just shown you that phonics works. Now that poor kid failed phonics, right? But if he did enough of it, he, would, he only got two out of 20, but maybe if he works hard at it, he'll get more out of 20 later on. So, we, we've done phonics, we've done our test, we've, uh, we've read the stories, we've done our work, um, and I want to ask now what we might have learned, okay? So in English, there are 44 sounds, essentially. You know, it's gonna get more complicated in a second. There are 44 sounds. And in fact, teaching kids 44 sounds, so you know, there's 26 letters of the alphabet, some of them have more than one sound to them. There are diphthongs, which two letters produce a sound, but there are only 44 of them. And how many three-year-olds know 44 dinosaurs, or 44 princesses, or 44 Thomas trains? I mean, it's setting the sights pretty low. Most kids that are pre-literate can remember 44 things, and they remember them pretty quickly, and they don't need a teacher to teach them, right? So this business of thinking that that's enough to teach kids 44 sound letter correspondences in English, um, it's hopeless. It's, it's setting the sights really low. So one question is, why would we bother arguing? This was the question that Mary asked. Uh, we can just say, yes, of course, let's teach the 44 <coughs> sounds and we'll have it done by Wednesday. Um, but um, um, uh, it's trivial and it's part of what learning needs to be learned. Okay, we're not saying you don't need to learn phonics, but it's pretty, it's pretty damn trivial. And people might know, just by way of background, that in the theory of this sort of, um, in phonics theory, uh, there are two kinds of approaches. One is synthetic phonics, and what we just saw was synthetic phonics, which is putting sounds together to make the word cat. There's another whole tradition called analytic phonics, which you start with a cat story, and you see the word cat, and you unpack the word cat, thinking about cats as opposed to something that's unimaginable. So, um, you know, in a sense, if we were to do any form of phonics at all, it might be, the, it's the analytic phonics, which kind of makes a little bit more sense, but again, we finished that by Wednesday. Now, I said that was what we might have learned one, but what I want to ask now is, what we might have learned too. What are we really learning when we're doing phonics? And um, when we were last in Sao Paulo, Mary and I, we went down to an art exhibition in the railway station, um, uh, which is above the, um, which was, well, no, the railway headquarters, which were used as the jail during the Hunza period. Um, and there's the jail downstairs, I don't know whether you've been to it, and then upstairs there's an art gallery. And there was this amazing piece of work where 48 banned books um, during the Hunter period were nailed to the wall. See the big nail through the edge of the books? 
Um, um, so if we want to refer to that tradition and that history, um, education is distantly practiced, getting used to, still, to being still and being bored, sitting still and getting bored, getting used to these little kids, sit still, this is boring, but just do it and behave yourself. Um, and learning to give the right answers on command. Yes, that's a fish or a, a dish or a losh or a, you know, blah, 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 and I can do it. You tell me to do something absurd and I'll do it because you tell me. Um, so, but also phonics is then an antidote to, I put communism there in inverted commas, um, but maybe it really is an antidote to communism. Um, it's too, too dangerous to have children mean by themselves. Um, and phonics in that, this sense is, um, it is educational. Now, what I want to do in the next part of this talk is I want to get seriously into what phonics really is in a technical way. Um, um, and, and I want to come to some conclusions about what it really is in reality and how, in theory, in linguistics theory, it's an almost unworkable concept and therefore almost unteachable. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm going to do is I am going to start with a phonics lesson because I've, you know, you've done a test already and what I need to do as a teacher is I need to give you a lesson. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out of here now and go into this quite wonderful uh, YouTube video. Um, which is, I don't know how many screens down, I've buried it here, um, and I am going to uh, make that up to the whole screen. When I was 16 years old, my father was diagnosed with a rare form of lung cancer. Oh, that that's an ad for future. Consider the following sentence. The same letter combination, O-U-G-H, appears repeatedly throughout the sentence, but the sounds are different every time. Though I coughed roughly and hiccuped throughout the lecture, I still thought I could plow through the rest of it. This incredible inconsistency can make English really hard to master for non-native speakers. But what if English were phonetically consistent? Let's consider the letter A. The letter A can represent a number of different sounds. Even ignoring its combined sounds, like AR or AW, you can get such diverse sounds as father, ape, and apple. Let's take the first of these, ah, as in father. Now, ah is not alone in having different options for how it can be pronounced. Let's consider the vowel, e. Neglecting combination sounds like er, we can still produce some strong different pronunciations such as rewrite, elk, and one. Let's tap the first of these again, e, as in rewrite. Of course, this means that silent E's at the end of words will now also be vocalizing. Moving on, let's consider the vowel I. Ignoring combination sounds like the IR or ING, this vowel can produce easy sounds. Lucky, igloo, and DBAT. Again, talking the first of these, we'll pronounce the I as in likey. Let's now turn our attention to the vowel O. Without combination sounds, we can style get a few options. Pony, on, and money. Let's see the fires to one of these. O, as I'm pony. Have I no money these silic shions? We are left with only a vowel. You. The vowel you can sound like a dice. Get it, and you can keep on going. It ends up being some language that no one else can, can understand. So what I'm going to do is I am going to now um, go back to the thing here and, and let's talk about phonics um, uh, um, seriously. It's actually too hard to be possible. Don't even try it because there are um, thousands of sounds in English. So when linguists are trying to identify sounds in English, and I'm presuming, you know, I'm, I'm Portuguese may be different. I'm talking just about English at the moment. Um, th there are actually thousands, but probably they're innumerable. And um, not even the 170 characters in, read that for me. This is in phonetics. It's the International Phonetic Alphabet in phonetics. So what the phonetic alphabet tries to do is create 170 characters which capture every sound in every human language. And of course, it abjectly fails because you can't read phonetics and ever come up with anything which is like spoken, like spoken language. So there isn't this um, reasonable correspondence between speaking and, um, and, um, and, 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 and writing anyhow. So this, yeah, there's a fundamental technical problem about what, what we're trying to achieve. Let me tell you a, the secret of 
Siri. Does Siri operate on phonics? So Siri is synthetic speech. Now, Siri's secret, by the way, um, is Siri on Apple. Um, um, is Siri is, a, is one woman. It's a single woman whose name is Susan Bennett, who worked for the company which used military money in the US. It's a fascinating story to produce this voice synthesis activity. And of course, Apple doesn't invent things, and Facebook doesn't invent things. They buy people who have invented things. So they bought this company, um, um, which was called Siri, and Siri still exists, and Susan Bennett. Now, what did Susan Bennett do? She didn't use all the letters of the phonetic alphabet. She used whole words. And what she did is, over a period of weeks, she was a voice actor and normally did advertisements. And over a period of weeks, um, she uh, recorded whole words, which could then be recombined into sentences. So if digital text can't operate with phonics and doesn't operate phonically and operates with whole words, why should any of us do that? And in fact, all speech recognition operates on whole words, doesn't operate on phonics. Phonics is not a reality which even speech recognition can use in a digital world. But perhaps the most important point is sounding is too practical, uh, too slow to be practicable for reading. So cut actor, I can't come to the word cut actor in a, that's an easy word in a sentence, um, and sound it out to be able to get to meaningful stuff. I mean, I end up seeing uh, whole words. Um, so what I want to do is I want to actually introduce a very important theoretical analytical category at the moment around phonics and phonics as a, a theory. Uh, you might have seen this book and you might laugh. This is the theoretical category that I want to use. It's, it's, but this is by uh, a book by a philosopher, a professor of philosophy at Princeton University. And I want to talk about some of the ways in which you know, it's, it's nonsense, it's unusable, it's unworkable. You know, we, we, we're enforcing this on the students, uh, but it's actually, it's, it's, um, it's rubbish. And it's rubbish in a couple of ways. One is it's stupid because it's not even enough for effective compliance. So if we want to be out there in the world and we want to be a business person or we want to be stuck, we might be building websites or we might be uh, talking to customers in a store. I'm just trying to think of the most right-wing, idealised view of the world. Um, we might be uh, doing all sorts of things in a very conservative kind of way. Um, and phonics isn't any good for any of that, um, um, let alone critique. Um, so whatever we might want to do in education, this is the point where we can run a non-political argument about this, right? An argument which has it both ways. If there's one world where the best possible construction we could put on people who want to be in this compliant world is access and opportunity. The kids want to become business people, they want to become uh, website developers, they want to become all these things and we want them to be that. Um, uh, um, we might say our agenda is access and opportunity and it's no good for that. But it's also no good for diversity and transformation. If we want to actually think of how do we take control of our lives in the world, how do we participate, how do we recognise each other's diversity, it's no good for that either. So one of the questions I want to ask um, is what we want to put in its place. And now what I'm saying um, as a kind of a way of um, apology in advance is going to get more difficult and, um, and not as funny as phonics is. <laughs> so um, what we've been working on is we've been working on um, uh, this idea of a multimodal grammar. So if you forgive me for a second, I will um, you know, take about 10 minutes being theoretical and academic about what an alternative might be. Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about more and more is how incredibly radically different text and speech are. And the phonics is a very good example of how radically different they are. It seems as if this text is a simple transliteration of speech. It isn't that. And in fact, the grammar of spoken discourse and the grammar of written discourse are fundamentally different. And one of the reasons, um, in this multimodal world, what we've come to think is that, in fact, text is incredibly closely aligned to image, right? So it's something we see with our eyes uh, as we're writing and as we're reading. And in fact, it naturally fits with diagramming, with spatial design, with layout. And the logic of text is essentially a spatial text. Whereas the logic of um, uh, um, uh, speech is an audio logic. So even in terms of the human sensorium, what we are as human beings, um, text and image are very closely connected in what we sense and the way we sense uh, sound and, um, and, and speech are obviously very closely aligned. And they couldn't be more different from each other. 
So one of the challenges of multimodality is how do we cross these boundaries when it comes to meaning. And the word that Mary and I have begun to develop, and she mentioned it in the introduction, is the idea of transposition. So the real thing is how do we move something from one radically different space to another? It's not simply, it's not so simple that you can pull sound across to, to you know, to, to, uh, to, to an image via phonics. It's just not that simple. It's actually a different kinds of meaning in very different kinds of spaces. Now, for little kids, the poor kids that were doing that horrible phonics stuff, there are actually easy ways to start this. One is meaningful children's books, where there's writing beside the pictures, and the pictures are often beautiful, and the stories are often beautiful, unlike those things that we just saw. Mm -hmm. um, or speech to sound, meaningful children's songs, where you actually don't understand all the words, but you sing the song, and after a while, oh, that's what that word means because it's contextualized. Um, so, um, but what I want to do is move on on the next slide to talk about the new textual world that we work in. And again, I'm going to be technical for a second. Um, this, people may or may not know about Unicode. Mm -hmm. So what Unicode is now, fascinatingly, and uh, we as literacy educators tend to neglect how fascinating this is, there is a single universal scripting system in the world which is called Unicode. It's on my phone. Um, it's in everything. Every, 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 every computer, everything is based on a single scripting system, which how it's possible to move files backwards and forwards, for example. And what's interesting about this scripting system, it consists of 136,000 characters, which is every character in every human language, um, that's including lost you know, ancient languages, um, but also includes um, numbers and includes 3,053 emojis. Um, so, and what's interesting about this, and this is the universality of it, which is quite important. When I'm doing literacy now, I'm putting little emojis in, and little emojis are being suggested. The Facebook emoji is different from the Microsoft, uh, the, the, um, the, the Microsoft emoji, um, is different from the Samsung emoji, but when I communicate across platforms, the underlying scripting system <coughs> re-renders those and translates them. So what we have is a universal meaning system which is out there, um, which is just fascinating. Now, the most fascinating thing about it, from my point of view, is this includes all the phonemes, and the phonemes almost don't exist in terms of almost everything in there is what we call an ideograph. So here's the theory behind it. What we have in this universal scripting system is things that we call graphemes. So what Mary and I have tried to do is find words to describe this. So if we want to talk to the kids about phonics, and we want to talk to the kids about literacy, what are the words we're going to use? So what graphemes do, and everything in Unicode is a grapheme, um, we have phonemes which are vowels, consonants, sometimes we put two letters together and that's a diphthong, we have some diacritical marks, we have punctuation, and these are very, very, very limited markers of what the sound of speech does, by the way, incredibly limited, I've just demonstrated that. But nearly everything in Unicode is ideographs. So all of Chinese is ideographic, not entirely, there's some sound represented in Chinese um, characters as well. But numbers, fascinating thing, numbers are, are ideographs. You know, it's a, it's a symbol that, that uh, relates to a concept. So we're doing numbers with kids in school, and that's part of literacy, and they're not phonemic, right? Um, um, there's a whole part of symbols, you know, the up symbol, the down symbol, all the symbols that are the standard um, icons on an interface, um, which are now more or less universal, forward, backward, stop, all of those things are all symbolic, but also emojis are an incredibly important part of the world of, of everyday speech, if you like, and speaking communication. But the last point I want to make about ideographs, which is really important, in reality, in alphabetical languages, not Chinese, which is entirely ideographic or nearly entirely ideographic, we operate with ideographs. We see whole words. We see the word cat, and we learn to see the word cat. We never spell it out. If we become fluent readers, we're seeing whole words. Um, and one of the things is there's a fundamental biophysical reality of this. This is not, um, you, know, um, you know, it's just the way in which humans see. And what we do when we read is we have these things called saccades, where our eye jumps across to clusters of letters. It never, never sounds things. And those clusters become connected uh, with, um, with, they're semantically based. We see things which have semantic meaning. Jump, duh, which past tense of jump. Right, we see the jump on, we see the CDOD. So we're picking out these criterial features, which are actually semantic features. So what I'm doing here is a kind of a elaborate critique of, of, 
phonics. Why phonics is, to use the theoretical concept I introduced earlier, why it's bullshit. Um, so here we are in this digital world now where the world's being turned upside down. So our kids um, here are doing swipes. They're moving around. They're following icons. They're in this profoundly multimodal world. So to separate out phonics, and they're not... You know, there's, there's not a connection between phonemes in this world, in the world of meaning, in the world of navigation. It's just, it's just a nonsense. And by the way, let me come back to the point I made before about the nonsense. It's a nonsense from a right-wing point of view. I want people to be business people. I want them to be entrepreneurs. I want them to be fundamentalist Christians. I want them to be... I can think of a whole lot of things. I want them to think it doesn't matter the Amazon burns down. Um, but it's not... Phonics is not going to help you have any of those thoughts. But um, um, let alone other kinds of thoughts. So we rewrite in Unicode, screen navigation is visual, the gestural, there's a lot of this stuff going on, swiping, navigation. This is, remember I said text and, and, and sight are closely aligned? They're more closely aligned than ever around these movements that we make, these visual movements we make in order to navigate text. Um, and speech recognition I mentioned only operates in whole words. Digital speech recognition, the technology uh, only does that. Now, I warned you I was going to get theoretical, and I'm going to get worse. Sorry, before I get better, I'm going to get worse. Um, so Mary and I have been struggling with some of these ideas in this new stuff that we call transpositional grammar. So what we're interested in is, we're interested in grammar. We want to sound like we're old-fashioned for all... No, we like the idea of grammar, by the way, which is one of the patterns of meaning in the world. What we mean by grammar is meaning patterns, right? But the transpositional idea is that we're constantly moving between image and text. Right? And, we, our, and, our, and our meanings are in constant movement. They're not fluid. It's not a matter about fixing things um, in a static kind of way, which structuralisms did, including Saussure and whatever. There's a whole tradition of linguistics of fixing things into systems. In fact, the systems are in movement. So that's what we want to use. And we, uh, Mary and I have just produced these. It ended up being two books, um, which are coming out later this year, where we try to build a kind of a technical parsing of the multimodal world as a grammar. And the theory we've got goes like this. Um, the, there are all these forms of meaning which connect with each other. And what we've done is we've put these here roughly beside each other um, with text and speech maximally a long way apart. These things kind of sit beside each other. We move between one and the other. But one of the biggest movements of all is between text and speech. And what we've been trying to, try to do is develop a common language with which to speak about all forms of meaning all of these forms, right? Um, and um, what we've developed is what we have, what we call five questions about meaning. So our argument is, if we want to parse the world, um, which is the Freudian notion of what's the world mean to us, uh, and that world might be text, or it might be image, or it might be speech, or it might be embodied movement. These are five relatively simple questions we can ask for, we can ask. And they're the, the grammatical categories we want to use. Reference, agency, structure, context, interest. Now, getting really difficult now, just to try to give you a summary of seven or eight hundred pages of two books. Um, um, so meaning forms are the material ways to make meaning. Our big emphasis is on meaning. So when we write, we use media. When we speak, we use media, sound, uh, image, or whatever. Um, and so the forms of meaning are uh, the grabbing these media from the world and using them to make meaning. And these five questions are functions of meaning, things we do. So these are the five um, these are the five things we do with meaning. Okay? So they're functions. Um, so I've said before, text and speech are, are maximally different. Um, um, and text is um, linked to an image and space, speech is sound and body. These things are um, things which fit together and now, I want to give you a, an example now of why we need to shift the, le the level of grammatical understanding up a layer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, the idea that happens in English, I'm, I've moved away from phonics now, um, um, between a proper noun, one thing, definite article, you know, a, a dog or the dog or, or something, um, uh, no, the dog, um, and an image, right? And instances of things we can capture in a photograph. Or we can have many, many things going together. I'm going to get to an educational point in a second about cognition. So you've got to be patient with me for the moment while I get there. So these are things that we make in text with these co 
kinds of grammatical constructions, and the parallel in image is this. And what I want to do just for a moment, how am I going for time, Daniel? You're, you're, you're okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not that far off being done, if you can be patient with me. No, you have to go plenty of time. Then so, um, this is the kind of thing we need to do, bringing these things together. And um, Mary and I, you may or may not know, we both are historians. We both have history PhDs. So we can't stop ourselves going back and trying to reconstruct the origins of things. So the origins of visual concepts. Um, this was um, uh, invented um, uh, uh, I'll have to go back one step. Um, people might have heard the Vienna, uh, the Vienna Circle, a very famous group of philosophers. And one of the key people in the Vienna Circle was a man who's long since been forgotten by most people by the name of Otto Neurath. And Neurath invented pictorial statistics. And you're going to see um, uh, how we, they're now a pervasive part of our life and they're a pervasive part of Unicode, in fact. Um, so what he did is he set up the Museum of Society and Economy in Vienna in 1925. Um, and this was in the museum. You can see these diagrams on the wall, these pictographs uh, on the wall. Now, what I want to do is, uh, before I talk about him again, I want to jump to Vygotsky. And I want to jump to what we miss when we do phonics. So, um, let's think of, if we, if we focus on the meaning of a word, um, this is a, a quote, a wonderful quote from Vygotsky, um, uh, who worked very closely with Luria. Luria was just as interesting as Vygotsky in a lot of ways, and neglected. Um, uh, what Vygotsky said, there's a difference between me, as a kid, as a very young baby, saying, a, Dog is it's this dog, my dog, a specific dog, and dogs in general. And if we become uh, scientific about dogs, which we do in schools, eventually dog means something different. It means it's a species, and it means dogs can either breed, and they can't breed with cats because they're. Sp so we learn these criterial features, and what academic discourse is about is a shift in what Vygotsky says from concrete, uh, complex thinking to conceptual thinking. So let me give you an example. I'm going to go back to um, how this kind of grammar, the distinction between an instance and concept, then becomes relevant. Uh, I'm going to go back to my, my historical example. This is a picture of Otto Neurath, who was um, in the, the Soviet government, the Bavarian Soviet government, socialist government of 1919. And um, uh, this photograph was taken while he was the commissar for public housing or something in that time, uh, during that short period. And later on, the photographer who took this picture became Hitler's official photographer. And when this picture was, re, was republished during the Hitler period, this, the caption was, the Jew, Neurath. So here we have an image which is an un, unavoidably singular person, Neurath. So this is the singular person who was a communist during the revolution of 1919 and who was a Jew for the Nazis. But it's one person, it's a singular person, right? So this is a grammatical concept that we, want to, that we want to try and talk about. Using this example, this is one of their beautiful uh, pictorial statistics they created for the museum in the 19, early 1920s in Austria. So uh, when the, uh, the revolution failed, he moved to Austria and worked for the socialist municipal, municipal government in Vienna. So here, this is the, actually the first time this beautiful kind of iconography is used, which is now the world of you know, the toilets at the airport and whatever, this world of using people like this. But what he was doing was counting. So each of these people there is not a single person, but they count for many people, right? So in other words, this is this conceptual representation of a person as opposed to this singular person in the picture. So if I go back to my grammatical point here, that we have instances like this which photographs do images and instances do proper nouns, concepts, uh, are common nouns, and we can use icons and pictographs to do it. So this is the sort of thing we might be doing in grammar in school. I'm going back to an arcane, obscure historical origins of this reality, but this is stuff where this is w the way we might be rebuilding what we do as grammar in schools. Um, so these are some of the transpositions: form to form, which is um, you know moving from image to text. Function to function is these are different ways of looking at things. So what I want to do is um, I want to end with a couple of concluding slides now, which is towards a meaningful pedagogy. 
So we saw at the beginning when I started with those phonic slides, utterly meaningless pedagogy, deliberately, wantonly, absurdly meaningless pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we create a pedagogy of engagement? With beautiful stories and lovely songs, um, with things that actually mean things. Um, um, it's not to tell the rules of the world in order to elicit compliance to those rules, but a dialogue between the cultural schoolings and students very life worlds. You know, what engages them? It's not a matter of just coming in and you tell them these are the rules and learn the rules, because as we know, kids have many different ways of speaking as a, you know, around class, around um, um, uh, dialect, languages spoken at home, and so on. And the final thing is, um, uh, you know, what is our educational mission then in this context? It's to be, um, to be literate is to be able to mean with effect, to be able to mean what you want to do effectively. It's not about learning these rules. The rules are a trivial part of that. Um, and what our, what's our politics then is the politics of open pedagogy without prejudice to, sorry, that should be two, the kinds of futures that are in the making. So whether it's access and opportunity, which is not inconsistent with the conservative agenda, or whether it's diversity and transformation, um, you know, that's an open question in a way, but we need to give learners the tools to me. For folks who want to be more connected with some of the stuff we do, that's our website, and we've got a Facebook page, and if you want to go and join our platform Scholar, set up an account, and there's a community in there called Thank you. I'm just wondering whether Mary would like to, to say something now. I'm going to go back to... She said she would like to. She would like to. So I'm going to go back now to... Um, let me close the PowerPoint. And let me close... Let me go back. Oh, there's Mary there now. Okay, Lucia. Yeah. Um, uh, now, how do we get that microphone to work again? Do you want to speak and see if you can hear Yes, hello, I'm speaking. Yes, that's good. We can hear you. Well, yep. <laughs> well, I'd like to like to apologise to the what um, really introduced me the text of what you're supposed to write about trans relational uh, growth and math and and the transpositions that we're talking about took us three years put together and you put it together in I think uh, in a less than thirty minutes. So um, I'm glad because I just wanted to make a few points uh, following on what Bill said. And the first one is uh, that, as you yourself have said, and in the paper in the paper that I read, uh, our countries, your country, our country, wherever we are, there's still a lot of diversity in our classroom and huge gaps. We have to recognise that. No matter if we're in a, an elite uh, environment or a poor environment, uh, our learners come with different needs. So there's never going to be a single approach to anything, right? And I want to emphasise this because our teachers have to, instead of being part of the war, as I said earlier, we have to be, prepare them with repertoires, right? Uh, how to uh, navigate around uh, the politics that have just been introduced in your country, in Australia, and everywhere else about politics, how you navigate around that, and how you have a repertoire that you can use to extend beyond that. So that's the first point I want to make, and I think, um, uh, you know, I, won't, I can't reference all the people who make these points, but certainly uh, you guys have called for a reframing of the critiques you make and uh, the educator to reflect upon uh, what they've done so far and what they need to do in the future. The second point is what Bill makes about the new age of meaning making for all our children. Now, I know your children, like the children I deal with, I mean, I got up this morning and my three-year-old and my ten-year-old were talking to a machine, right? There's a little machine there and they were talking to it and they were asking it to play the songs they wanted to hear. The three-year-old takes my phone and knows the difference between uh, where the YouTube is and where the uh, photographs are and, and where the games are. And he can navigate that. That's a language. He's making meaning in it and linking it to uh, his desires. It's not about the digital divide. These are the kinds of skills that kids are learning uh, in all, in, from very different backgrounds. So we have to anticipate, I think it's still outlined, that the kind of meaning making they're going to have to come uh, will have to be multimodal. Uh, and um, it, 
it's important. And the third point, uh, remember I started off by, by quoting uh, that free air quote that was in Daniel's and Anna's paper. Um, a transpositional grammar, the, I think there's a lot of conversation going on in, in the literary circles about uh, the fluidity of meaning making. And why has this come up? It's come up because of the new technology. It's come up because of multimodality. It's not an accident that uh, people who are involved in linguistics and grammar are all talking uh, about those kinds of shifts in the way that they've never spoken about them. So how do we prepare learners for those shifts? And finally, again, I'm gonna, my, my last point, uh, my very last point is, uh, if we want to engage seriously in changing what happens to curriculum, we have to find ourselves in the arena of what is assessed. Uh, because unless we can do that, our teachers will not have those repertoires. They'll be de delivering to whatever assessment uh, regime uh, the school insists on. So that, they're the four points I wanted to make, but I do want to say more generally again, going back to Anna's paper and Danielle's paper, uh, you have a big battle like the rest of us about how to communicate to parents, to principals, to schools, to, to regions. And we can only do that by taking Bill's last point, if you want your children to be citizens, workers, and learners of the world, what sorts of skills do they need? What kind of pedagogy? What kind of curriculum? Uh, the parents need to know that as well. The, the system needs to know that. And we need to have that kind of conversation. And I think you're right. The, a social networking platform gives us voice into cracks and corners that we never could before. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, and uh, well, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Are you back? Okay. Does anybody want to comment? Lynn first. So, do you have comments? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Are you, li are you, can you hear us? Yes? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, Lynn wants to start the debate. Anybody else? Do you have questions or comments here? Yes, Sandro. And then Valkyria. And then, uh, just for those who are watching online, you can send your questions through the chat, YouTube chat, or Gabriel is checking the emails as well. So both ways, okay? We are waiting for your questions, comments. So Lynn, then Sandro, then Valkyria. Thank you. Um, the comment I have is in relation to what Mary said and generally what we're talking about. Um, Mary said that um, uh, speaking to Anna and uh, Danielle's paper, uh, you said we shouldn't, you know, as if phonics is a lost battle, um, and we shouldn't waste our time uh, talking about this. It's a used term, wasted opportunity. Uh, and you said we should focus on enabling and more positive aspects. Right? Uh, but, you know, when you said you should focus on enabling, talking to teachers, how they can work themselves, uh, work their way through this, you said that they'll come across a barrier at the end, I'm not sure what term you use, but the assessment, which they can't do anything about, which is which comes from the top. Right? Now, what we are trying to do, here, and, and you and you put yourself against critique, which which I assumed you, you, you said this doesn't really speak to teachers. Uh, we are in a, when we're talking about phonics here, we're in a situation, this is what I call my, the title here, I brought back the word, authoritarianism, we're in a situation where phonics, the context of phonics, and that's also where you use contextualization, how important that is. So just to contextualize why we're talking about phonics here, we're contextualizing this uh, within attacks which have uh, been aimed at the academy and especially the humanities. So this, behind the logic of scientificity and evidence-based universality of phonics is the, the, the basis for eliminating us and the humanities. Right? And this is what's happening at the moment. You know, uh, uh, the government, the same government that's proposing phonics is also proposing uh, that universities should be self-funding. 
in the private sector and as we know from our experience so far, the private sector will not be interested in, in funding the humanities. So it's actually an end. What they're proposing is an end of humanities, including education. So just to situate why we are more focused probably on critique, because we're not really speaking to teachers here. We're we are mobilizing, let's say, um, the our society outside the academy in, in I don't know, for, for support. You know? uh, uh, so uh, if we were worry, how uh, teachers are Sorry, agree. can I uh, respond? Because yeah. I have to leave sure. soon. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes perfect. Maria, we're in a, a surreal, we're in a surreal moment. Right? This is a surreal moment for your country and the country we're in. And that's why I thought the paper that said uh, we academics have to rethink what we're doing. I was going to say is, of course we have to do critique at the level of saying, analysing phonics with a greater degree of sophistication and depth than they do, and saying that it's bullshit, right? So that's um, critique. But I think what um, the other side of the coin is, how do we then take a practical argument to teachers and to parents and whatever, and we say, look, this is not going to help your kids. You know, this is really not helpful. This is just a certain... This is just a smoke screen. This is just nonsense. And you know what do your kids need, um, and they need to operate in this digital world. They've already <laughs> probably got these devices and communicating all these kinds of ways. How do we build on that rather than do something which is utterly boring and irrelevant and going to send them crazy? So you know, um, so there's kind of two discourses. The critique discourse is important. I mean, what Mary meant by that, and she's still trying to connect. So I'll, I'll elaborate. Our um, very good friend who died a, few, a month ago, Conte Chris, um, used to say to us just, you know, in private conversations, and this is, it sort of resonates with us all the time, he said, look, I'm kind of sick of academics to do critique all the time because we need to change the world. It's the old, we didn't use the, the, the Marx connection, but, you know, I can use the Marx connection, can't I? Um, I'm on, on YouTube. Um, you know, the point is to change the world, not just to analyse the world. So, you know, I think we need to do both. We need to analyse stuff systematically in order to be able to say it's bullshit, right, and it's, it's unscientific. You know, they say we've got scientific evidence and we just say, okay, you've just proven a nonsense that you set out to prove. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, so that's kind of a complicated... So don't you think there are moments of one and the other? Um, I am going to... Uh, there we go. I'm going to try to... Oh, well, I might be able to get Mary back, sorry. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that, you know, I, I, I understand perfectly what, what Mary is saying, what you're saying, but I, what I'm saying is that uh, at the moment, if we don't sufficiently push for a change in the proposal, once the proposal becomes policy, there's very little we can do. Oh, no? um, the proposal became policy the day these people were voted in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, Australia just had an election the same, and they're doing it today in Australia. So, you know. You can, I mean, they're going to do the policy, um, and, and, but um, one of the ironies about this moment, and this is taking a real long shot, which makes it different from authoritarian regimes, is this is a moment where they are radically withering away the state. These are not strong states, and what they're doing is they're busily privatising things, they're busily... So one of the things is that gives an opportunity for civil society to become relatively autonomous. So here's Valkyria and the group here, the National Project, talking about let's have autonomous ways of doing things. At the same time, the state is becoming kind of weaker because by neoliberalism means it abdicates its, its social responsibilities into education. As it abdicates those responsibilities, there's possibilities in civil society and with these new media to create these alternative kind of spaces as well. I'm not saying... I'm not being hugely optimistic about the political effect that it'll have, but there is, it, it is a strange moment. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when I was writing my MA dissertation, uh, I found out that only, according to an institution which I cannot remember right now, uh, according to such an institution, eight, just eight percent of Brazilian people can fully comprehend a text. And uh, when you say that the phonics work, what do you mean by it? I, uh, what I mean, uh, the phonics work for work for what? So. Right. Uh, as from Biesta, we have to to have to ask this question: the education is good, but what for? What kind of citizens are, uh, do we aim to to form? Uh, yep. Is it related to to phonics, to the code, and to understand uh, the grapheme, to decode the graphemes into sounds? Is enough for the person to be fully liter liter literate? Literate. Or not? Mm -hmm. It's just about behaving yourself. We'll give you a rubbish word, and you you will learn how to spell it mm -hmm. for no reason other than you need to learn to do as you're told. Yes, <laughs> and I just think.
the point is now, it's not something new. It's we are rescuing and rescuing and reinterpreting this image and this visual now with another logics, right? It's not only the logics that we used to have in the written language society. Now it's another logics. That's the way I understand. So for me, at the same time, it is like uh, trying to design a, the, a grammar of a new new society, like, such as the new the digital society, uh, in order to be able to keep up this, let's say, a certain curriculum, a certain understanding in, in institutions, right? But at the same time, dealing with what is plural with the students. Do I understand it? Such as the example that you gave between photograph and then icon and pictograph, right? It, the idea is that icon is much more generalized, and photograph is not a generalization, it's very unique, right? It's a single thing. Yeah. So maybe we should always be working with the two concepts together, right? Okay, so that's the comment. Oh. Just checking, understanding. It's very back on. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Turn YouTube off now. Turn YouTube off now. She's got the phone on. Okay. We can, yeah. we can, we've got you back again. Yeah, yeah. But just, let, me just, let me just finish a last sentence, okay, that I was saying. So in the 90s, when right after we had a dictatorship, you know, uh, as people say, you know, salt. I never know whether the verb is right when it refers to dictatorship. But we started talking to, to critique again, but not exactly as, as the word critique, right? For example, this is then what I worked in my PhD, is a, title, uh, a concept called uh, expanding perspectives, expanding views. Because then that would be softer, I think, for teachers and for students to understand that what, what I meant by critical was their possibility to uh, expand perspectives so that they could make choices yeah. instead of just believing there is just a, an only reality or context. Okay. Great. Um, uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Still? Yes, yes, Mary. Yes, well, I was able to hear you luckily because I had the YouTube on and Mario and well, Kira, I heard you both. Um, I just have to say, and I'm going to insist a little bit on this because you know we're fellow travelers, we agree about those things that you're saying, but this is a very surreal moment that we are living in, and I don't think uh, that uh, critique and defensiveness is our main position. Right? It's not just being defensive. Can, can you still hear me? Yes. 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 I mean, oh. I'm just saying for some, some madness that happened at that G7 meeting. Uh, the French and the Germans said it was a very stressful meeting. Um, that there wasn't any agreement and they had to navigate around the truth. Right? And what did the President of America say? It was a terrific meeting. They had great unity. Um, everything was going to be solved. We are dealing with that kind of mentality, uh, these kind of unreal uh, proclamations of people in power that have no, no basis in truth or logic, right? And you're, you have exactly the same situation. So how can you fight that with truth and logic? You have to fight it with a forward agenda. You have to fight for, uh, do it with a pragmatic agenda, uh, arming uh, your teachers not only to deal with the exam at the end, uh, but how they deal with the precious time they have with learners to ensure that they can be uh, participating in the world effectively. And they have to collaborate to do that. We need entirely different strategies. It's about the historic moment and the strategies that are required of this historic moment, not the moments that we've had so far. And I think people of our age who are so good at what we're doing and so great at analyzing, so great at critiquing, so great at promoting good values. We cannot only do that. 
right? That's what I'm saying. We cannot, uh, we have to do that amongst ourselves, but the strategy at, uh, for um, uh, working with educators has to be much more enabling than simply defensive. But that's the only point I was trying to make, not to say critique wasn't valuable and wasn't, uh, didn't have a place. It will not combat the kind of politics and the kinds of policies we have at the moment. We need workaround strategies. We need uh, s scaffolding strategies. We need help to open up what happens in the classroom to allow that light in the crack. Because uh, otherwise, we would just be left being defensive and ignored. But that's the only point I wanted to make. And I have to leave now. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to uh, be part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Um, we have two questions. Can I read the questions from people who are online? So the first one is from Simoni Hashiguchi. She's from the Federal University of Uberlandia. Uh, uh, yeah. So thank you for thank you all for the stimulating presentations. I'd like to ask Anna Daniel and everybody a little bit more about your analysis of the recent decree of the Credit of Abitza And the second question is from Clarissa Jordan, she's from Paraná. Estou ouvindo vocês, fiquei pensando na seguinte questão. Como vocês percebem a relação ou a não relação entre o caderno, né, o, de, o caderno de alfabetização, o decreto, e a BNCC, especialmente na introdução à disciplina de inglês. Uh, so, the, the Clarissa is asking about the relationship or, or <laughs> debate three um, between this degree of, of literacy and the uh, our national base comum curricular. Who wants to, would you like to say? Wow, such big questions. Um, yes, Clarissa, I see that uh, there is a, a, a very strong connection between our new literacy policy and the, our new national Common Core curriculum. Although the Common Core curriculum was published by Temer, it's been orchestrated quite uh, perfectly uh, since then, and, and both of them do have a, a, a strong emphasis on, on prescription, normativity, universalisms, and the like. So they are aligned, they are aligned indeed. Um, and as for Simone, uh, it would take us longer to, to get to the analysis of the decree as well as the manual, but um, uh, in our analysis, Daniel and I also uh, pointed out that uh, besides the discourse of critique, that is pretty much related to what Mary was referring to as a, a defending ourselves and, and fighting against what uh, is being proposed to us. We also uh, came up with a need, an urgent need, not only for a, a discourse of critique, but a discourse of self-critique, in which we, researchers and teachers from the field uh, dealing with literacy issues, would have to to also elaborate a critique from the inside out. Um, and my argument uh, might be a bit polemic, but the way I see it is that many secretariats of education, be them municipal or state, have been constructive oriented. Uh, they, they have their own documents and their own, their own in-service teacher programs that for some years have been oriented by a more social cultural lens. The thing is that we, we have a huge country, we have heterogeneity uh, that is you know, so present and alive in our schools. And it's quite hard uh, for us to, to, to fight back illiteracy performance levels. Uh, my concern is that this uh, has been uh, transformed into one more argument so that the common sense might read the new phonic based instruction policy as the solution, as a redemption policy that will definitely put an end on our literacy performance levels. What has happened to our policies uh, if they are, they have been partially based on, on a more social cultural lenses? What has happened 
So we have also to establish a self-critique moment for us to strengthen as a collective uh, and, 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 and rethink and reinvent, as Magna Soares has uh, kept saying, the reinvention of literacy. Uh, it's, it's time that we, we also have this self-reflection moment uh, to find ways to build a kind of dialogue with those that have been already persuaded by this pervasive new literacy policy. What do you... Yeah. Do you have... I, I agree. Um, Ana, Ana Paula, uh, I think that... Um, I think I've said this before, during Valkyrie's homage, uh, we, what happened, I think this self-critique, the lack of self-critique is uh, so visible when we are taken by surprise that this government comes in and does all of these things. So what happened when a year ago we couldn't have imagined that we'd be where we are now? What happened? And as you were saying that uh, in, in relation more specifically to education and teaching of uh, literacy of text. Yes, there have been, uh, especially in the Southeast, various uh, uh, secretariats of education were, had already adopted a, a social constructionist kind of perspective, and this has been going for at least 20 years, right? Uh, now, I have, an, I have a, a feeling about this. I won't say, uh, uh, let me air this um, with, at risk of being, uh, I'm generalizing, but it's a feeling. Um, I think, and I'm using to understand this feeling two things which Bob Intuitive Social Sense talks about. And he says that we have, um, in our social critique, we tend to fall into both on the left and on the right. And I think that's where social constructivism saw itself as coming from the left, right? Because it has been having its origins in theory, taking into account the student's context. Uh, of origin, community of origin, etc. Et and what uh, Sosa Santos says is a critique that he makes when he criticizes both the left and the right. He says, we have been dominated by um, uh, two logics of analysis. A logic of regulation, which tries to find order in everything, the logic of grammar, let's say. The logic of regulation, which assumes that we go from uh, uh, a space of chaos to a space, and we arrive at a space of order. And so, whether we're on the left or on the right, we we tend to understand we what we what we're looking at as chaos, and then we want to get to the space of order. So we end up imposing our varying concepts of order on that on what we're dealing with, um, and very often for either one or the other, what it, what we disagree about is our concept of order. We have a concept of order, but we don't agree about our concept of order. And, or let's say we have conflicting grounds, right? Uh, and that ends up as being a space of confusion, and we see that in various sec secretaries of education, uh, they get nowhere. So when they try to put that social construction constructionism into practice, it never works, so it doesn't get anywhere, right? So they, it's perceived as a lack of order. Now what uh, Sosa Santos proposes is that we should uh, look for a different logic, a logic that he calls solidarity. And this connected to what Bill and Mary are talking about as Franz's position. Uh, a logic of solidarity does not want to go from chaos to order, from a lack of order, with no grammar to a grammar, because then the grammar will, the point will be whose grammar? Why one grammar and not another? But to go from a logic of uh, inequality, so what we have are various proposals depend with different uh, validity about in, in, re in relation to power and who is proposing them. So we go from a logic of, uh, we go from a, a state of inequality, plurality and inequality, to a, a point of solidarity where we try and understand the various proposals that, it, that exist and see what apply to which context, right? for what reasons. And so we bring critique there into uh, pedagogical proposals. So we, we end up in using the term grammar, for example, not as one grammar, but as various grammars, right? but uh, conditioned by or 
but not to, to say determined by, conditioned by different possibilities, different, different spaces, different conditions, different, a grammar that works with children may not be a grammar that works with high school, for example, or with universities. And the word that he uses is not transposition. He says what we need is the concept of, of a, a critical translation. And when he says what we need, we need to use translation when we have diversity and inequality to go from one proposal to another. Not translation as meaning going from a lack of meaning to full meaning. Translation as understanding that we come from different languages, let's say, semiotically. Uh, probably we will never understand each other, but ethically we need to because we're living and occupying the same space. So solidarity comes in there in the sense of we are occupying the same space, we are going to be citizens of the same space, and so what we need is sometimes even to understand that we can't understand. But we will try to understand. We must try to understand. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an ethical impulse. Translation is an ethical impetus to, to understand, but not with no guarantees of total full understanding, which would be the idea of getting to a single grammar. Right? So recognizing that we have different grammars, and we have to take into account the complexity of navigating between different grammars. But not that every, everything goes, or that there is no meaning at all. Mm -hmm. I just say something, I, uh, uh, because Ling was saying that uh, if we look at the, the, the heterogeneous um, demands that children drink at schools, probably one of our weaknesses has, has been seeing the literacy issues as a, a, a part as a whole attitude. You're not considering the whole, you're just considering a part of it. Uh, if we take into account that literacy has more than one dimension, not only social culture, but also cognitive, yes, yeah, we have to acknowledge that there are cognitive aspects to be taken into account. Not this cognitive that has been proposed by this national policy, but a cognitive perspective is also important sometimes, and it has, brought, it has to, to be brought to the fore as well, as well, along with the social, cultural, linguistic, and cognitive dimensions. So, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody from here? Is a question, a comment? You? Do you want to say anything else? No. <laughs> okay, so I think we can, can, can we close the, the debate. Okay, so um, thank you very much, everybody, for being yeah, here. Yeah, postpone the debate. <laughs> <laughs> Respond, yeah. So uh, thank you all for being here. I'd like to just to, Gabriela, have you received the, the emails? So the, no questions, okay. So those who are online, there are 65 people watching now from all over the country. Uh, please send the, your information through, to our email, projetonacionalsp at gmail.com, and we'll send you the certificate. And also you have this recorded, vai ficar gravado, né, Miraldo? As pessoas podem acessar. And the slides, we'll send, send the slides to everybody, okay? So thanks, Lynn, thanks, Valkyria, thanks, Ana Paula, thanks, Bill. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good afternoon.